So this space is mainly just to chat about DeFi. I know it says lunch hour, but it's probably not lunch hour for a lot of people since crypto is global, but it's a moon's lunch hour. Yeah, mine too. We're, we're a greedy. We want other, everyone to have lunch with us. Yeah. So, oh, you're in Europe? It's lunchtime. I did just order lunch, so this is super legit. Perfect. Yeah, 100%. I'm actually not eating lunch, but it is lunch hour. So. Are you intermittent fasting or something? Not on purpose. And uh, <laughs> if I was in front of any sort of keto doctor or nutritionist, I would be getting a severe mm. knuckle wrapping. But technically, I'm having a coffee and I haven't eaten today. So hypothetically, sure, I'm intermittent fasting. We are, we are in the same boat. Yeah, I'm in Canada with family, working like normal. But we're so I have eaten poutine, which if you don't know is French Ooh, fries poutine is- and cheese mm-hmm. curds and very fried almost daily. So I can't quite claim intermittent fasting. Yeah, no intermittent fasting is going to save you from that diet, man. <laughs> but then not eat for a week <laughs> if I'm still alive. I'm like- All right. One thing I wanted to bring up that's cool, and, and James, I think people might want to have questions for you, but I think one big piece of news is upcoming crypto legislation, which I've, I've seen various reviews from crypto Twitter, but I think it's a big deal. Okay. Which region's legislation and what's on the legislation? So it's a proposed bill. It's still got a ways to go. Basically, it's in the U.S. Uh, it's the U.S. Senate. Two senators uh, from both sides of the aisle have actually proposed it and they've done a lot of work in coordination with the lower for those not american there's two bodies of the u.s legislative department there's the senate and the house so they've actually worked together the main people pushing this bill is senator gillibrand from new york who's democrat and senator lummis from uh, wyoming who's a republican and a bitcoin bull there i got a kind of review i haven't reviewed everything about it the main things that it addresses at least for bitcoin is that any transactions under 200 dollars would not be taxable so it could actually be like used uh, buy something with it it's going to be regulated by the cftc as a commodity and not the sec and private wallets would be protected by law so i thought that was good news it was bullish and then a couple people were like a little bit, whoa, what about the rest of crypto? This is good for Bitcoin and Ethereum. This is bad for everyone else. So I didn't go too much deeper than that, but that's what I saw so far. Huh. Interesting. I is think there a sense if, if it's going to likely pass or likely go anywhere? So yeah, it needs, it basically, okay, so there's a bunch of committees that it goes through that basically have to endorse it. There's basically four committees that have to sit around and vote on it before it even would go to vote for law. If it gets through those, it's very rare that both it's co-sponsored by both sides of the aisle. And if they are in coordination, as I say, with the congressional folks, I would say it has a likely chance of passing. It has to get through these kind of four committees first. They'll probably change it. They change it around to what they want, and then they'll vote for it, the deal. So if they can come through that, we're still a bit far away from saying it's likely to pass because it's got, once we're through those four steps, I would say, it's likely to pass. Mm-hmm. I see. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at a thread right now from Adams Cochran that I read earlier that kind of gave some highlights from the bill. One of the interesting things I know is it you know, requires DAOs to be registered entities in the U.S. And I know Lummis from Wyoming was the one who pushed through the you know, Wyoming DAO where they've cr- created guidelines for DAOs to become registered entities in Wyoming. So it seems like there is some criteria there to make that federal registration of DAOs, which I'm, I'm curious to see what happens there. Another one of the interesting highlights he brings up is it puts a lot of assets as commodities under the CFTC, as you mentioned. But if there's any debt, equity, profit, revenue, dividend of any variety, then it is now expressly not a digital asset commodity. Huh. And so that I know raises a lot of questions for DeFi in general. Is this the same like new chatter that is saying Ethereum might be classified as a commun- uh, uh, like a security? Mm, I'm not sure. Again, I have zero law experience, but it seems like it would be considered as a commodity. But based on it saying if it pays off any dividend, then it is now not a commodity. So that would be something like essentially liquid staking would not commodity, but ETH would be. But that's yeah. That wait. But if ETH produces a staking yield, isn't that does that count as dividend or not? Mm, ETH itself wouldn't create the yield. The protocol creates the yield, but the token itself doesn't generate. 
yields a lot unless it's staked. That, that's what I mean. If you stake mm-hmm. ETH, it becomes a yield-bearing product. Doesn't that, I mm-hmm. guess, I don't know. I haven't caught up on this news, but I, I did see some chatter of that, that Bitcoin people were um, bullish on some legislation, and, and, but it was bearish on ETH people. But too much tribal warfare. I didn't look into it. It's going to change yeah. so many times. We're going to add new things. Yeah, Six next, next thing, there'll be a highway bill attached to it. Yeah, I'll only <laughs> vote for it if you, you give me $5 million for my highway so I can tell my voters that. I stood up for them. That's basically what's going to happen. Definitely something with healthcare being added. Florida will vote for it if they approve that Miami is like the Bitcoin capital of the U.S. Mm-hmm. Anyway, all joking aside, yeah, that's great. It, I think it's important. Personally, I don't think they're going to do anything that's going to negatively affect Ethereum either because uh, I think it's too big to fail. I think half of the congressmen voting on it hold Ethereum as well as Bitcoin. So I think it's unlikely they're going to throw it under the bus. A lot of these other tokens projects they might we'll see yeah it's definitely overall bullish you think they could have come out with news like banning bitcoin and ETH or whatever saying you can't touch it or you're a criminal like that like at least they're talking about it in a positive sense yeah and i think the the rule about legally protecting people's right to hold their crypto in a private wallet is hugely important especially what kind of is going on in europe and i think the rest of the world will hopefully follow that i was going to say it makes it uh impossible to be an anonymous project according to so this thread i'm reading through right now i assume with how they're requiring DAOs to be registered in the u.s would prevent any non anonymous projects from existing so i'm also curious to see how that will shake out moving forward i shared a tweet i did that has the notes the alumnus is basically an overview of every section the bill is 68 pages long but this one is only this document's six pages long if anyone wants to download that, it's a PDF file. Cool. Yeah. Definitely need the TLDR. And this is like TLDR, this, even the abbreviation six pages. <laughs> so we'll have to get an even shorter one coming up today. Yeah. I think with everyone waiting for this, the most exciting part is it just gives some people direction instead of it being like a scary gray area. Whether or not it's something that aligns with what's going on in DeFi right now, at least if you're looking to start a, a protocol, there's a way, if this gets approved, to figure out how to do it right instead of just blocking access from the U.S. Yeah. Yeah, total mystery is, is not helpful. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to talk about in the space was just you guys' opinion on crypto conferences. I know with consensus coming up, we're going. We've got a few people from the Moon team going. And then permissionless just happening. I guess I'll go first with my opinion. Crypto is so decentralized. There's so many different people and most investors, people using these projects are just retail people in their house, in their apartment, buying and selling these projects and farming. There's no real interaction between the community except for on Discord and Telegram. And seeing these people get together at events and how similar they actually are and like similar interests outside of crypto. I, I just think it's going to be like world changing when you see these kind of things. I think it's huge. I, I love meeting you guys at Permissionless. I'm really, I'm happy I'm here, but I'm bummed out. I'm not coming to Austin, which I guess it's starting tomorrow, right? Yeah, tomorrow or Thursday. So there's Excel sheets of events going on for the conferences. I looked at the one for consensus, I guess the main one. There's 214 side events. Like it's people talk about the bear market. Either these projects prepaid or I don't know what, but there's going to be a lot of stuff happening. Yeah, crypto's go- not going anywhere. So the real players show up. I think that's huge. Yeah, I think it's interesting, man. To be fair, like it, it is, I think it's funny that we're in a digital industry and there's an argument. Actually, when we were at Permissionless, when somebody just randomly had come up to me, we were talking and he said something like, it's so crazy that we're having these in-person events when really it's crypto. We should all just be doing things online. And I thought that was such an interesting perspective because I'm like, Seeing people face to face is still, in my opinion, like an awesome experience. It still trumps just even a space like a space. This space is really cool. But like just being able to like actually laugh and look at somebody eye to eye, I think is still such an awesome experience. So like I think conferences, you're right, Tyler, man. I think it's it's never going away, man. I think it's just such a good thing for a space. Yeah, I think it's fun. You want to balance it out because if we were doing like in-person meetings five days a week, we'd be getting sick of it. <laughs> Vice versa, it's like, oh, I get to meet you in real life. That's so cool. Exactly. Exactly. I thought the same thing as a kid when uh, we'd watch like sporting events. I was big into NASCAR um, mm. and like football. And you watched on TV, 
and it's like you people pay to travel to these places just to watch it when they could just watch it on TV. It, it's the same thing with crypto. Like you could do it all online, but it's more fun when you got a bunch of people next to you and in the same environment and seeing the stuff. Yeah, the serendipity you get at events, you just can't replicate online. Like I just bump into random people at permissionless, um, and we start talking about something completely unplanned for. I think the things you can work on are all the things that you already know, kind of like the known knowns, but you can't really engineer something that wasn't planned for. And like these events where you can actually meet people you didn't intend to meet is the only way you can get like outside alpha, if you will, like outside yep. of your immediate sphere of intention. And I think that's just something that there is no replacement for that. Like Twitter serendipity is totally different. You have to intentionally DM someone, let's talk about this or let's work on this integration. But Bumping into someone in, a, in, in, in line at an event, like that can actually take you to a totally new places. So it is a little bit hard to quantify, but when it works, it's a 100%. Hey, can I piggyback off that? Yeah, definitely events is a cool thing. My name is Tony B and I'm the CEO of Green Zone, but to piggyback off of that, like when we do our events at the Long Beach, we just had one a beach cleanup and we had all these projects come out there to just clean a beach, NFTs recycling because we're a recycling company we reward crypto the people that recycle and just having all these projects just interacting with each other and just coming out for a good cause free food and making sure your community is cool that's what we need now is just just that in person i wanted to go to consensus because we're actually headquarters here in brownsville texas but we just had so many events just going on just trying to work and talk to people and that's the real adoption of crypto just sitting behind a computer yeah that's cool we can talk and everything but once you're in person with somebody, you're feeling their energy, their vibrations, that connection is just a whole nother experience that online can never compete to. So that's the great thing about in person. And thank you for having me come on and speak. Yeah, thanks for coming up and thanks for taking care of the environment. I know that's also something that's really bullish about crypto is you can really do whatever you want with it if you want to do a recycling thing or some kind of DAO or try to change the way people trade like Uniswap did or Curve or decentralized lending and borrowing. It's one of the few industries that a single person or a few people can get together and really make a huge impact. And there's projects that haven't even started yet that we don't know about that in five years is going to be insane. 100%. And some pretty wild stuff happens in Twitter spaces too. So stick around. I just want to ask everyone who's here in the room to please retweet the space. I want to get some more folks in here. We'll actually pin it to the top. I'll do it for you, Tyler. Uh, we can pin that to the top and ask everyone to retweet that so we get some more folks in here. Sweet, thanks. Also, if anyone has a topic and wants to speak, feel free to raise your hand. What else did you guys want to talk about, like James, Jason? I want to hear what you guys are doing right on DeFi, man. Are you still active or, or, or are people just like mostly just holding what their existing bags are? Like I've been LPing a little bit more just based on the thought that we're probably in a sideways crab market, maybe down. So just ETH USDC as vanilla as it gets, but ETH has been basically trending in this range. But of course, like everyone is like, what about impermanent loss? And I wonder what people's perspective is on that. But that's what I've been doing mostly. I figure basically this is if ETH doesn't really go anywhere for the time being, this is probably a, a pretty rug-free, stable way of, of attaining some yield. Yeah, there's definitely still some volume, especially if it goes up $200 one day and then downtown does the next. Are you doing like uni V3? So I have on V2 and V3. So on V2, I'm doing sushi on Arbitrum, where there seems to be, I think that is probably the highest volume sushi deployment right now, or highest at least yield. On, of course, on ETH mainnet, there's more volume, but was more money in the um, LP, so you don't get as much. And based on the stats right now, let's see, last 24 hours, so ETH USDC is, wow, it's only 6.6% on Ethereum on Sushi. On Arbitrum, it's 28%, so it's some days are pretty good. So I have this piece, and I, I did some Unib3, being very mindful of the impermanent loss there. Like, you can easily get double-digit impermanent loss very quickly. A paper came out last September that said most people lose money providing liquidity on Uniswap v3. I'm still not quite sure how to interpret that result. Yeah, I feel like picking end dates and, and just depending on the state of the market, that, that may just, it might have just been sensitivity on the data set they use for that study. But definitely Uniswap v3 is a little dicey if you're providing for exotic pairs. But ETH USDC, I think maybe not so dicey, but I'm still pretty, 
I haven't tried this, so it's just going to test our position. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Also, yeah, personally, I'm I'm not doing a ton right now. Just keeping an eye out, trying to pay attention to what's going on. I think, though, one of the interesting things is like just from yield farming in general and staking LP tokens, LPing has become like a very passive process or a lot of people are used to passively LPing. And with Uniswap V3, you can't really get away with that or you can get hammered with that double digit impermanent loss you were talking about, James. So I'm curious to see how Uniswap V3 management protocols grow i know i've seen a few already that just like automatically keep you in that target range and see how those can be applied down the road for other use cases where people can passively provide liquidity without being too afraid of you know that huge permanent loss because they're not keeping an eye on how the price is moving what do you think of those management tools like i guess a you're adding contract risk because you're using someone else's protocol to manage it and b if you rebalance and move like the band, aren't you realizing like impermanent loss piece by piece? To be honest, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I think you are certainly realizing it, but you're also realigning yourself into a range to catch the price movement and potentially save some of the impermanent losses you've lost on the other end. I'm not quite sure though. Okay. Tell what are you doing? My strategy was, you know, right when things started going down, I, you know, I, I was around in 2017 when all the like very new small cap stuff, all the hype stuff, ended up dying and really only the blue chip survived assumed that was going to happen again i was into some nfts so the the smaller nft projects just like totally sold out and only kept the blue chips same with tokens i don't do any of p but i'll hold tokens i believe in bitcoin and uh, ethereum polygon stuff that like right now i'm only investing in things where if it's going to be around in three years sure i can have some but if it's something where it's just a pump and dump no and, and I know some people like to try to chase the pump and numbers. They're like, oh, I know it's not going to survive long, but I'll just sell it on the way up. Like, I, I don't think it's a good time to do that stuff now. Yeah. yeah. That's that's actually where I come into it too, man. I've just been taking this time. I haven't really done too much LP stuff, but I've just been accumulating ETH and some BTC. And my passion projects are Polygon and Near Protocol. This is like in my backcourt, but yeah, pretty much that's been accumulating. How is everyone treating their ETH? As in, are they staking it? Are they using Lido? Are they holding it? Are they staking it themselves? I, I had a small Lido bag, but I, I think I got rid of it. And yeah, I'm basically LPing and holding it naked. I'm basically straight boomer vanilla. Been holding the same Bitcoin ETH since 2018. It's sitting in a couple places, not even DeFi fully, but some of it in like Nexo, Celsius, BlockFi, getting interest, and then... I'm exploring different DeFi pools cautiously. Yeah, I used to put stuff on mainly crypto.com, but sometimes Celsius and Neck. But it seems like they got some money. Like, I'm not saying specific companies, but just in general, like some of them have some money problems and like some risks with funds being stolen. So I just pulled everything out and it's just sitting in a on chain wallet. Can't go wrong with that. It's fine to lose like 4% yields to know it's safe. No one's interested in like liquid staking, huh? That's interesting. Are people just wary of risks or it's not worth it? I would be, but then I see that like the ST ETH is losing peg to ETH. I don't know if it's fixed now, if that was just a like scare when UST was happening, but there was a point where ST ETH was like a 2% discount to ETH. That's six months of interest right there. That's like law. And, and then people were talking about, oh, if it gets liquidated. So I, I don't know. I just, I don't want to risk it basically for four percent or whatever mm -hmm. it is now i think also one of the interesting things especially with st ETH, is as far as i know you can't claim it until the merge actually happens what you were saying tyler about it depegging it's yeah, essentially exactly. a gauge of community confidence in the merge mm -hmm. so i would say i'm so confident on it happening but same i haven't put a ton of funds into any liquid staking derivatives so discount right now is still two percent yeah totally given that ETH liquid staking is like four ish percent yeah, that's almost just not even worth it. Yeah, especially you know, if you're not a whale, you got to pay the gas fees for that, which also eats into gains when it's already such a small percentage. I'm, I'm curious to see if that changes tomorrow because I know the Robston Test Network is doing a test merge with ETH2, and the outcome of that will likely reflect the confidence of the merge actually happening sooner rather than later. And, and as I said, if the 
you know, price differential could be viewed as a way to gauge community interest on whether or not the merge will actually happen. Curious to see how that responds. Yeah, that's true. If something goes wrong with the merge, be careful with SDE. But if it goes well, yeah, hopefully it'll go back to peg. So Tyler, you're big into NFTs and I'm curious your take on one of these protocols. I sent it to you a while back and you didn't seem to think it was going to be very useful. It's called JPEG. It's one of the Tetra projects. It's basically a vault where you can deposit NFTs, blue chips, and borrow against it. And it's uh, right now supports punks and etherox. But I think ape support is the big one that's coming up next. I think that roughly speaking, you can borrow maybe a third of the floor of that project. So for punks and on its own, it wasn't taking off too much as 75 punks deposited in JPEG, but they started this kind of like interesting thing with curve this month, which is basically, so when you deposit your punk in there or your whatever ape, you withdraw their own form of stable coin. But right now it's called PUSD, I guess punk USD. And because the, these the people behind this have a lot of influence with curve, they basically created a curve pool for it. And the incentives there are pretty big. Let me see what it is right now. I think at launch, it was like giving upward of 40% if you cool. Uh, on that curve pool and people were like it's a curve it's a PUSD CRV pool so people are depositing CRV you can farm it but I think the thesis here what they're trying to do here is basically create a new like Aave for NFT blue chips and also use these curve incentives to attract people to actually deposit their punks since once they do that they can get this very specific stable that they can deposit in curve to get more yields as a ape like officiato how does all this sound to you? Yeah, the one, which is maybe a minor risk, would be, of course, the smart contract risk that you introduced with flocking things. But the, the main thing with NFTs, to me at least, is like just the sense of like community and like the utility of the NFT. I know a lot of projects say they have utility, but they don't. Debate that later. But people want to be in these gated discords. They want to have access to the merch drops and things like that. If you stake your NFT in JPEGs, it's not in your wallet. So you don't have the keys to be able to prove that you own the assets. Maybe they're working with projects to like still be able to prove ownership that you have it, even though it's locked in JPEGs. But at the current moment, I don't think that's the case. If they add support where you can get in the gated discords and get the token drop, and get the merch, if your NFT is staked, I think that's a lot. I think then it's actually would be usable. That's interesting. I think the fact that they supported punks probably is in part to the fact that punks have less utility than apes. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, punks are essentially, I guess it's like Ether Rocks where it's just released it and nothing happens. But as of, I don't know, two months ago, Yuga Labs, who owns Board Apes, they actually bought CryptoPunks. We'll, we'll see what they do with that. But yeah, I was gonna say we'll see if that actually means anything for the punk community. Though. Um, hey, sorry to interrupt you guys. I heard you talking about Ethereum the merge. Yeah, so I just have one thing to say about it. I feel like the merge is actually a bullish. What would I say? A bullish one for Ethereum because when you move from a proof of work to proof of stake where people stake more, there's more, there's little, the law of demand and supply. There's little demand, there's more supply somewhere. It makes the token go up somehow. So I'm really looking very bullish for Ethereum right now. So that's just what I want to say. Yeah, another thing to add on that, are you scared that when the merge happens and, and all this stake deep gets unlocked, I don't think it unlocks all right away. As it unlocks, do you think that's going to introduce selling pressure? No, I don't think it will um, introduce selling pressure. I think it will introduce buying pressure, which which would actually make the token price skyrocket. Shoot, we all hope so. Yeah, I, I think definitely the you know a big argument right now of ETH is environmental and energy consumption. So if it's totally proof of stake, I don't see how you could be against that. I think it's probably going to create some short term selling pressure. It's also by this point ETH isn't going anywhere, so you're going to have speculators, you're going to have whales who are going to wait for that selling pressure and buy a dip and then even if it drops five ten percent one day okay that got some whales a bunch of whales are gonna scoop up five ten million and sell it when it pumps back up ten percent it's long term next 10 20 years i'm extremely bullish on ethereum regardless of what happens in the short term yeah it's funny i was thinking yesterday about bitcoin versus ethereum and how people call bitcoin boomer coin just because it's 
know, less inefficient or less efficient and more power consuming than these newer projects. But then I, you think, okay, 13 years ago, there was no Bitcoin. Like no one had the idea of Bitcoin. People had the idea, but no one built it. And 12 years ago, it was brand new and huge new technology. And now people new to crypto, they're like, oh, it's so old. And why do you use it? And you would use Ethereum or Polygon or Terra 2.0. You know, ETH might have the same fate. People look at ETH, and but now all these new layer ones, they're just talking real bad about ETH. They can call it a boomer coin. In 20 years, they'll probably still call it a boomer coin, and it'll still be the most used. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's just it, stuff moves so fast. But I think look at who look at consensus isn't necessarily an Ethereum conference, but it basically is, right? Look who's behind the massive institutional power it's behind Bitcoin and Ethereum. I'm just saying, look. It's, Billions and billions of dollars, the, the a, a, what are they called, 816Z, their year of crypto report. Look how many coders are working on Ethereum, Ethereum projects. Like whatever innovations the other layer ones do that's better than Ethereum, Ethereum's just going to copy them and implement the, the most successful ones, in my humble opinion. I think one of the, I, I know the graph you're referencing for the 816Z report. Uh, you know, I, I think, although I entirely agree, I think it was a little misleading how they categorize the the development work because I think generally things are launched on ETH and then ported over to these other chains. And I'm assuming that they gather that data by scraping things on GitHub. And I know even if you look at some like Uniswap V2 forks that are launched on other chains, if you look through their code, you'd guess it was on Ethereum because they yeah. haven't even updated That's the variable names. They do launch on Ethereum. Yeah, yeah. All these, so many other layer one chains are actually EVM compatible. Like every mm -hmm. competitor that adds to the mix that's EVM compatible adds more power to Ethereum. Yeah, exactly. I agree. But we've seen what Solana's been doing recently, but we'll see how these other big out competitors that aren't EVM based perform moving forward. Solana is really the only exception to this, right? Like it's so incompatible that your developer base has to be real. It's not just like this opportunistic vampire attack on Ethereum mainnet. And it seems like the NFT activity on Solana is, is pretty healthy. I don't know if you follow that side at all, Tyler. Like, I think on volume basis, it's like neck and neck with ETH right now. <laughs> it was when they like launched the official beta on OpenSea, but it's really died down now. I, I couldn't tell you the numbers, but I know that I don't think there's any like Solana projects in the top 10 in the last week. But it, it's also when Solana really took off. I, I don't know if it's like the VC money, but also when you looked at like their lending and borrowing platforms and their trading platforms, Radium had $9 billion TBL sometime last year. I, I think that might have even been more than Uniswap, or at least on par. And it's, it was insane because it's 100 times less users. So I, yeah, it's just confusing how they have so much money and it's all going down now, but... Yeah, I, I think Solana is a good experiment for sure. Yeah, I was just going to piggyback and just say their NFT scene is interesting, to be fair. It's definitely a place to go get a quick flip. There's a ton of quick action happening on Solana just because of transaction fees. But there's also a ton of just like scammy stuff going on right now, at least in the NFT space on Solana. I wouldn't necessarily call it really a, a great spot to be NFT wise. But to your point, Tyler, it's an interesting experiment in kind of centralized decentralization. <laughs> yeah, the thing I don't like, and it's not just Solana, it's also Ethereum and any chain. A lot of these new projects, they see, they basically just copy what past have done. Like, I know the top Solana project was like Bored Ape Solana Club. Like, you couldn't even do something original. But yeah, they did. They did. It was like OK Bears or something, which was, uh, yeah, which was basically like a their version of uh, Bored Ape Yacht Club. Yeah. yeah, that one was like at least original even ethereum you go on like open now everything is just goblin clones because yep. goblin's really taken off but you know, it's probably gonna be something else next week but i don't know i just there needs to be more original ideas and it's just so easy to copy something and make a quick buck rather than just do something new there was in crypto yeah it is always a wave and everybody tries to ride the wave so during that time of, what did you call it, OK Bears, people started doing you no know, OK Bears and all these things. So I think they were trying to ride the wave. And you can't, when the wave is, is happening, you can't, how do I put it? You can't go against the wave. You have to follow the wave. Then wait for another wave to come. Do you get what I'm trying to say? 
Yeah, yeah. Yep. It's interesting, actually, too. Is, and this folds a little bit into James's point in terms of like how people are generating like buzz or whatever not. Because even in the NFT space, I think a lot of what the new kind of meta seems to be is staking your NFTs on the NFT's original platform. So Lil Friends, I think like Dipsies, there are a bunch of the new NFTs that have dropped that are like, okay, buy the NFT, stake it on our platform, you'll get weed token or, or whatever it is. And with that, you can get whitelist spots to other projects or merch or whatever the case may be. So that seems to be like the new wave. So there are actually a few projects that have come out on ETH right now that are taking advantage of that, I think, and look pretty sound, but yeah. Yeah, but I totally get you, my friend. Jason, what's your experience being the last couple of months kind of like getting deep into crypto? What's the most surprising thing you learned or experienced about it? Most surprising thing? I'd say, honestly, the most surprising thing I'd say is coming from like the pre-crypto world and hearing like all the stuff about like energy consumption and gross excess and like the volatility or whatever. Not, I think... The volatility is definitely something that I'm like, as I more I learn about crypto, more I'm like, oh yeah, super young emerging industry and there is a ton of volatility here. But I'm also finding myself surprised, I think, by the fact that it's not nearly as consumptive as I think like the traditional markets like to make it seem. I think that there's been, there's so much potential, I think, just for generational wealth and growth in the industry and relative or contrasting to the amount of like energy like i i think i'd actually put up a tweet about this like a few days ago actually that there's such a huge push by the government around oh proof of work it takes up so much energy and there's so much waste being used to run or power this industry when compared to pretty much every other industry on the planet whether it's military or pharmaceuticals or whatever not crypto as a whole is it's like a rounding factor. It's not even like a, a bullet point in the amount of consumption that is used globally. So I think probably one of the biggest things that I've gleaned on this journey isn't so much to any one specific product as much as it is to the industry as a whole and to how threatening it is to the uh, status quo. <laughs> I'm surprised like energy is a primary narrative. Like I never thought about energy the whole time I was using crypto. Maybe I'm a monster. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah wow. it's, but, it, it's, but it, it is crazy. It's funny how that's like one of the main linchpins that uh, between that and the boogeyman of illicit activity. <laughs> yeah, it's so lame. The whole point of humanity is to gather more energy. It's not how much about energy you have right now. Mm -hmm. Like any discussion about, oh, this uses too much energy is just missing the entire point that we are not capturing enough energy. We haven't even captured one percent the radiation of the sun we're not even a type one kardashian civilization it's pathetic like we need to be gathering more energy like Did at, say type one be. kardashian kardashian scale star trek reference i was missing you're being actually scientific sorry about that <laughs> kardashian yeah we remember like the kardashians are probably using more energy than bitcoin right now anyway like there is just so much energy we are not capturing and debating over the 1% energy of Bitcoin is just so pathetic. It's basically exactly. this is this is the level of our civilization and we should not aspire to much more than that. Like Everything about waste and conservation is just fundamentally this diversion about not being a more productive like species as a whole. There's the upper bound is so much higher than, than where we are right now. It's yeah, it's shocking. Yep, yep. I think one one interesting article I read on the Bitcoin energy usage is uh, Harvard Business Review did like an analysis of how much energy it actually uses. And essentially the finding is although the energy usage is high, the carbon consumption is not what you would expect, which is what people are really concerned about because most mining operations are just like buying and using excess energy. So like energy that would not be used. And so from that perspective, it's actually just like using energy that would be thrown away. Yeah, Carson, I, and I'm not sure if it was the same study that I read because it was like, I think it was like 0.2% of uh, like carbon emissions, like relative to like its nearest competitor, which I think was healthcare, which was like, I, I forgot, it was like, I don't know, like 17 or 20%. It was like some ridiculous number, like orders of magnitude greater than the emissions of not even just Bitcoin, but it was like like crypto, like carbon emissions in general. It was yeah, crazy. this was May 2021. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, it was like Bitcoin energy usage is about the same as Malaysia or Sweden. So, yeah, yeah. I came from the energy sector 
anyone that like talks about the negative impacts for Bitcoin, like they don't understand that. Like they just look at the news headlines. It's just, you know, oh, it, if you do a Bitcoin transaction, it's the same energy as a house for three months. It's okay, if there's cars and all this other stuff. It, even in Texas, a couple hours where I live, there there's a few mining farms. And it actually acts as like a battery to the grid and they eliminate the need for these peaker plants. And if you don't know what a peaker plant is, it's basically like a plant that only turns on in the middle of the day for people to run their AC. And it's very, it's perfect. Yeah. yeah basically but, Bitcoin mining literally is, is that it can scoop up the energy that's wasted in non peak periods. And as a miner, you're incentivized to get cheaper energy. So you're literally incentivized to make the energy grid more efficient. So it's a nice side effect. Yeah, they're also helping build the like, infrastructure for updating power lines and things like that. And another thing, too, is like if there is an emergency where a power plant trips and they're, they're consuming too much energy where the current power plants can't keep up, like the Bitcoin miners can shut down in a minute and they actually get paid to do that from the energy companies. So it's, yeah, it's a lot better than blackouts or rolling blackouts where everyone's yeah. without power. Yeah. Never mind power emergency. What if we have an emergency where, you know, your sovereign dollar is inflating to infinity? I don't know if you guys saw that thread. <laughs> Sounds familiar. What was it? Kim.com. You guys read that. I don't know how to pin things. I was going to pin it. But it, it's actually very interesting. It's like a doomsday scenario, but it's a lot of solid points. Basically, it talks about, everyone talks about the debt, but like how it's unsustainable and how, like it's so unsustainable that there comes a point where something has to happen, something not good. 100%. And what their solution is, of course, to cut the money supply and, and shove the country into a recession. So it goes can go both, bad both ways. Have you guys watched the uh, Ray Dalio Changing World Order YouTube video? No, I got to see that. I, I've probably seen a few s snippets. Oh, my God. 40 minutes. When you have 40 minutes to do nothing but watch that video and focus and think and pay attention, it's one of the best videos I've seen on YouTube. That's awesome. Yeah, so I, I think we'll probably have eight more minutes here, and then we'll wrap up. I think we budgeted an hour, but I, I guess any topics that, that you guys want to talk about? What about? Oh, I see Korean join. How are you doing, Korean? I'd like to talk about NFTs in Solana. We we have some pretty hyped um, means coming up, I think, this week or so. We've seen a couple of ones done well. If anyone watched Vandal City yesterday, it was greatly a flop. And I think that was because of the edge of that. I, I don't like that mechanism. Just Deep is launching today. If anyone, is anyone excited? I don't have it just a but I'm just saying, if it goes well, I think the Solana NFTs, the mints coming up should actually do well too. But if it doesn't do well, then I think we're in for Roma anymore. Yeah, I'll have to look into it. Actually, can you, what was the, what's the project you're talking about? Just a, it's launching today. Yeah, it's launching today. I'm hoping they don't do more than two at the same time because then they'll have to, to shut down the network. Well, interesting, I, I don't know if you saw the thing about uh, they recently had double spend Bug on I saw that. Is what's the TLDR? Is it like actually a big deal, or is it just like that Bitcoin double spend where it was? A bug? It seems to be part of the reason they went down to quickly resolve that, which I guess they fixed it. But I don't know. The whole root of crypto is to solve the double spend. So that is literally it, the only job. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it it was very in the weeds of how Solana works, and I've hardly been able to get you know. I'm far from in the weeds on, on how Solana works under the hood. So I wasn't quite able to understand it. I guess it has to do with different transaction types and how they're propagated. But yeah, pretty crazy. Yeah. It, like I said earlier, I think Solana is a great experiment. I know people use it, but it, it's very unproven. And it's there are mistakes. And I think it's very beneficial to move fast and make mistakes. Maybe not Solana because there's a bunch of people's money on the line. You think about what's the worst case, and maybe they're thinking about this, but you know, the worst case, let's say there's a double spend problem and someone happens to take like all the tokens on Solana. They shut off all the bridges, they'd have to make a new chain and then just like, airdrop everyone the tokens they had before. And that's obviously going to be a huge deal, but I, I don't know. I, I think they're just, it seems... Yeah, good. what, we'll end up with Solana Classic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you end up like, literally, they will, yeah. Th that's assuming that people want to keep up with Solana Classic. And I know there's some forks that probably just die out. Speaking of forks, what do you guys think about the like Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Satoshi Vision? I, like, how are the market caps so high? I, I guess, in my opinion, people just didn't claim the 
airdrop. Yeah, I guess it wasn't an airdrop, but like they didn't I mean, know they have the tokens. BCH had some kind of momentum going after the original fork and enough use. Pretty much Craig Wright, I think, burned that to the ground with BSV. BSV is on a steady and deliberate path to zero. Rome wasn't built in a day. BSV won't get to zero in a day, but it's on the way. I, I think, didn't Bitcoin Cash pass Ethereum for an hour in market cap? Once upon a time, maybe. BCH was crushing it until Craig showed up. BCH was yeah. like the fourth crypto, even if, yeah, it might have passed Ethereum. Yeah, I remember, and I think Victolic even quote tweeted Roger Ver and was like, seriously, congratulations, like being nice about it. Yeah, it was probably like super vicious, right? Yeah, I don't know. I think he just said thanks because, you know. He's, he came back on Twitter. He was gone for a year, like the most exciting year in crypto's history. And he came back a few weeks ago and he's trashing BTC. And he's like, the most useful cryptos are like Dogecoin, BCH, Monero, and, and Litecoin. And BTC is garbage. Like he's, he was on the spaces with XRP folks. He's trying to make some momentum on trashing BTC, which should be interesting. But I think that was a poor choice, given he could have stressed whatever use case. Obviously, a lot of cryptos are now doing the same thing, but the speedy transactions and cross-border payments. I think if he focused on that, there would be some more hope, but I think he's following the Craig Wright path of trying to burn everything down to, to make more for himself. Yeah, once you spend a majority of your time like criticizing other projects and making excuses, that's the time it's over. Like the Richard, the Richard Hart syndrome. Yeah, like you spend time just trying to save what you built or trying to just talk down on everything else it's over if you spend all of your time like trying to do cleanup work you can't come back from that yeah and he's not up there on capitol hill talking about the the crypto bill the actual leaders of the industry are yeah so guys a quick maybe one last kind of question around my end it's just like an eth question here so you know where we're sitting right now where everything's red obviously right now and it's nothing's looking super comfortable but he's sitting around like 1780 or something like that like if we close like below 1700 or above 1900 that's gonna I think bump our price one way or the other. It's going to resolve the this kind of like little locked in pattern we're in anyway. What do you guys think? What do you, do you guys think that we're going to hang around this range for the next couple of months until midterms? What do you guys think is our short to midterm outlook here? I don't really like speculating, but if if you look at the past cycles, after a huge run up like that, it's usually a period of just down flat, which I think the last three weeks, Bitcoin is, I saw a chart, it's basically been like within two thousand dollars of thirty thousand. So, yeah, obviously everyone hopes it doesn't go down lower, but th there's a real chance it could. Yeah, no, I have a similar opinion. I was just curious. <laughs> um, I think it's going to be um, more. I think I have an answer to your question. In my own humble opinion, yeah, I think we're in. I did for yesterday. Yesterday we saw a fake pump because you see everything pumping up, but the next day or the next day or the day after, you see everything going down again. If you have a couple of these pumps frequently, I think we, we might break out very soon. So I started DCing into some blue chips, maybe Ethereum, Solana. I call Solana a blue chip because I feel it is one to get. That's just my take on it. Yeah, I, I think Solana would basically be like a blue chip because it's just so high market cap. But what's up, Michael? Hi. First of all, thanks for joining late. So sorry about that. And I, I honestly, I don't have any valuable input in terms of price speculation or any form of technical analysis. But I'm going to shoot my shot for the 30 seconds. I'm a huge fan of James. Previously, I was on another Twitter space where we talked about red wine back in the day. And I've been James following your career ever since you became famous at ARC. I, one loaded question for you. Outside of your Twitter feed, for those of you who want to follow and get your thoughts really generally from a macro level and then all your views, is there any other mediums to kind of follow you on outside of here? Do you have a sub stack or anything? I feel like a fanboy right now. And putting you on the spot, but just had to ask. Thanks, Michael. No, man, I'm mostly just on Twitter. I had a sub stack, but I stopped writing since I joined the moon and, and got busy with work. But um, e even on Twitter, I'm not super active these days because it's just like building takes quite a lot of time. I don't know how people, I don't know how Elon can, can shit can, post all day. <laughs> can we bribe yeah. you with red wine to restart that sub stack or get, get you back on Twitter? I don't know. I think I'm basically, it's this is what I can manage right now. And also, I only tweet when there's something. I, I, th I think it's on my mind that right now it's just, I don't know, there's much to say. Everyone's just grinding it out in the bear or crab market. I've shared some kind of just basically what I'm doing uh, in terms of lo looking into being a little bit more involved with uh, pr liquidity provisioning, but 
yeah, it's not as active. I think you should, I, I, I'm flattered, but I think you should diversify your diet. There are so many great like minds in, in crypto and I have a few lists that that track them. Other people have lists, favorites. Or like, I think any piece by Arthur Hayes is mandatory reading. I was going to mention this to Jason who's asking about medium term outlook. Arthur's macro it's like one of one of the very few people who can go all the way from a money supply all the way down to altcoin token emissions and specific NFTs. Like it's his top to bottom grasp is, is just breathtaking. On top of that, he's a um, ridiculously good writer. Like I'm not jealous that he is smarter in, in the whole the investing stack. I'm jealous he's, he's such a good writer. Like he has no business being such a good writer. James, you definitely ping me that. Like, like, yeah, ping that over to me. <laughs> Yes, yes. And there are a lot of great sub stacks that track what's happening daily. Probably the best source to keep up with crypto is this thing called the the, the Daily Ape by Darren. It's a telegram group. Yeah. Every morning he sends out a bunch of links. I don't know how he keeps up with it. It is incredible. But yeah, there's a lot of great content out there and uh, definitely soak it up. Yeah, taking notes here. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's good to it's good to see that you're still you're still out there. <laughs> Cheers, Michael. Okay, yeah, I think we budgeted an hour. We're a little bit over. Alexandre, what's up? Have a good afternoon, everybody. Oh, that was the wave and bye. Okay, okay. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining. I had a lot of fun. Thanks thanks for coming up and speaking. It's nice to just chat and do these kind of things. Oh, okay. Yeah, bye-bye. Yep, later. That's all we have time for today, folks. I and everyone at Amun really appreciate you stopping by. Please don't forget to follow us on social media, Twitter at Amun, A-M-U-N, Telegram at Amun Tokens, or stop by our Discord and join in the conversation. If you are Chinese speaking, we now have a Telegram group just for you, Amun Tokens CN. We are also on Reddit at r slash Amun Tokens. Amun also puts out a monthly newsletter with the latest insights on the crypto market. You can sign up for that wonderful piece of writing on the bottom of our homepage. If you're looking for a place to call home, there's nothing better than the Amun community. Looking forward to chatting with you and see you guys next time.